So what I knew about God was that God was Jesus's father and Jesus was a white man in a beard, right? So to me, a child, God was a white man in a beard because like, right, my mom, I'm a white girl. My mom's a white girl. You know what I mean? So to me, that's what God was, was Jesus's father was a white man in a beard. So I was talking to him and said, whatever was going on in my life that I just couldn't do this anymore. And that I needed you to, I needed him to show himself to me. I said, I actually want you to appear at the foot of my bed. Of which of course, yes. Of which course he didn't. Right. And that day I never believed in God again. Okay. You opened the door to spirituality, Mm -hmm. and I thought it was a really great segue to do for part two. And let's start with just how did you grow up and was spirituality or religion a part of your life? I was raised Methodist. And so we were, when I was young, I was born in New Jersey and I don't have a lot of memories, but I do remember we would have to go to Sunday school. And I remember a bus would pick us up and take us to church for different events or whatever. Um, And then when we moved to Las Vegas, when I was eight, my dad found a Methodist church and we went to church there. I I know we went on Sundays. I do remember going on Sundays and I remember we had the envelopes where you have to put your money in to, you know, for your tithing. tithing. And when I was about uh, 10, 11 years old, um, I remember, I don't know what was going on in my life, but I do remember having a conversation, laying in bed by myself, saying, talking to God. Now, let me back up and say who God was to me at this time. So what I knew about God was that God was Jesus's father and Jesus was a white man in a beard, right? So to me, a child, God was a white man in a beard because like, right, my mom, I'm a white girl. My mom's a white girl. You know what I mean? So to me, that's what God was, was Jesus's father was a white man in a beard. So I was talking to him and said, whatever was going on in my life that I just couldn't do this anymore. And that I needed you to, I needed him to show himself to me. I said, I actually want you to appear at the foot of my bed. Of which course, yes. Of which course he didn't. Right. And that day I never believed in God again. Okay. Now, Mm -hmm back up a little bit. When I lived in New Jersey, I don't know exactly how old I was, like three, four, five years old. I used to have a recurring dream that I was a witch, not a witch, like with a wart on your nose, but I was a witch, like the Salem witch trials that I had these powers to um, heal people. And, and unfortunately, right, you use the word witch and it's a negative connotation, but that's what I was shown is that I was a witch. Um, But I, my, it was not something I felt comfortable ever being able to talk to my parents. It was a little bit scary. Um, and so it just was never, you know, I never, I just, it just kind of like, it was just not something that was ever discussed. And then life happens and things happen and specific events don't matter, but kind of my connection was severed at some point in time. Now I'm, you know, when I was very young, now I'm 10 years old, laying in bed, asking God to show himself. He doesn't, I completely lost my connection to God. And you'll also hear me use the word source creator. I like the word universe because again, to me, God for a lot of people is whether they know it's like a white man, you know, Jesus's father, that's to me, not what God is. But, um, so I like to use source universe. Um, but I lost my completely lost my connection at that time. And then when I was 13, it was Easter and we were forced to go to church. My, I have an older brother and sister and I had to wear a dress and it was a yellow dress and I'm a tomboy and dresses don't make any sense to me. And, you know, I had to wear a dress to go to church and I thought, I don't like, how can there be a God that forces you to wear a dress where you are not comfortable that what does that have to do with any kind of connection? I could not, I could not reconcile it. And I never went back to church again. Like that's it. That was the last time I went. Um, then when I was in my twenties, um, certainly by the time I'd gotten to my thirties, I started getting this nagging feeling that I needed to go to church. Like it was, I didn't know anything about signs or intuition or any of that. I just had this nagging feeling to go back to church, but I knew intellectually church just did not make sense to me. I could not even step into a church for me. Um, 
where I was at my life at that point in my life, but it kept, you know, someone out there, right. Was tapping in saying, mm-hmm. it's time to get your connection back. I just didn't know what that was. And I was getting all kind of signs, but again, I didn't know that I was getting signs. And then I got to a point in my life. I was, um, in my, I'm trying to think of like which house I was living in. I was in my early forties and I had my law firm and it was doing well. Um, I had a great life on the outside. You know, everything was great. I was married. I had a good relationship. We got along well, we didn't fight. Um, you know, I had the 3000 square foot home. I had a pool. I lived on a half acre. I had animals. I was doing what I loved. I had a successful law firm and, but on the inside I was dying and, um, I didn't know how to describe it at the time. Now I know I completely disconnected from my soul. Obviously, I was still connected a little bit, but that's the best way I can describe it. And for two weeks in December 2012, 2012, right? Funny. Um, I begged God. Now, this is a God I didn't believe in, but I begged God every single night to please take me. I could not do this anymore. I could. No. I did not want to wake up. I didn't want to be here. I couldn't do this anymore. And um, after two weeks, I called my friend Maria, who you know, and um, and I, I'll tell you the backstory of how I met Maria. But I called Maria and I said, I can't do this anymore. I just I for two weeks now I've asked God and I just keep waking up. And if I'm going to keep waking up, something has to give. I can't keep living like this. And she said, I have a book for you that I want you to read, but I'm going to give you a pamphlet first on it that I want you to read about it before I give you the book. And I said, no, um, I don't want the pamphlet. At this point in time, I knew enough that if she was presenting me with a book, I needed to read the book. So I said, just give me the book. I don't want your pamphlet. I know that (laughs) I'm supposed to read the book. The book was A Course in Miracles, which then, of course, and I'm getting goosebumps, changed the trajectory of my life completely. But when I was in law school, um, I co-founded the student chapter of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And when we did that, we started doing volunteer work in the city and we um, ended up working with a no-kill shelter um, in Nevada. And I was there one day and I met this girl named Maria, lady. She was, you know, she's roughly my age, a little older than me, but, um, and we started talking and just having little conversations here and there. We both obviously love animals and that's kind of what our conversation was about. And then one day she's talking to me. I knew I was missing something, but I didn't know what I was missing. You know, you don't know what you don't know, but I just knew I was missing something. And she started talking to me about energy and how energy flows and just all this stuff. And literally a light bulb, I'm not exaggerating, a light bulb went off on my head and I'm like, that's the missing information. This is what I'm missing. So she said she read a book by Eric Pearl called The Reconnection, Reconnection, I think it's called. Um, And so I went and I got that book and I started reading it. And then at the end of the book, they have you practice moving energy with your hands. And I did it. It was so incredible. It was like, this is what I'm missing right now. I know it's quantum physics energy. Right. Um, But at the time it was just, I'm like, this, this is what I need. I need more information. So now Marie and my relationship kind of changed because I could talk to her about this kind of stuff. So segue, you know, however many years went by and I just said, I can't do this anymore. And so I started reading A Course in Miracles and I always call myself, a, I was a closet courser because the only person knew I was reading the book was Maria. Nobody else knew I was reading it. Not even the people that lived in the same house as me didn't know I was reading it like under the covers, you know, with no one. I just didn't want anyone to know. Um, and when I opened the book and it would reference God. I couldn't even say the word because again, to me, God was a white man with a beard and I had no connection to God, none. And I just, I couldn't say the word. So I said, okay, if I'm going to read this book, which I know I'm supposed to read because it was given to me by Maria, I need to figure out how to get over this word. So I just replaced it with Holy Spirit, not even knowing what that was. I just know that I had heard the word right from my religious days, but I don't know what it is. So as I'm reading through it and I would just, when that would come up, I just say Holy Spirit and it would just let me keep reading. So about halfway through that book is when I finally realized, oh, this is not the God that's a white man with a beard. (laughs) 
they don't, that's not what God is. And so then, you know, I realized, right, it's source, it's creator, it's this energy that's out there. Um, and then I was able to use the word God, but I don't like using it to the general public because I, for me, it has too many connotations. Triggers. Yeah. Triggers well, with people it. Get yeah. Triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. So I just like to use source <laughs> or a universe is my favorite, favorite thing. Cause, because the universe for me is all encompassing. I don't know if it's coming from source, if it's coming from angels, people will say who talked to you? Well, I don't know. Does it matter? Because it's just energy coming in when I get my information, it doesn't matter who's talking to me. Um, it just is that I'm listening to the information. And if we're all energy ener anyway, and we're all one, does it matter if I label it that it's Archangel Michael or a different angel or its source. It doesn't matter because it's all one. Well, the the majority of people want to label everything because that's how they've been programmed and right. trained. So a label makes sense. Right. But what the work that, that we are evolving into is the world of non-label. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we do it yep. in little steps. Yep. Yep. So I read A Course in Miracles. I finished it in four months. Um, <laughs> it's supposed you know to take a year. <laughs> well, so they, it's, it's three sections. The one section that you have to do every day, that takes a year. And everybody mm -hmm. told me I could not run through it. So that <laughs> section I got through in a year. But the other part, the reading it, I did in, in four months. Again, it was just the right book at the right time at where I needed it. And so and I, I was able to get through it. Now, I'd be lying if I said I understood all of it, right? Of course, I didn't. There, I struggled with a lot of it. It was, it's incredible to me how you do a lesson and the universe brings to you exactly what you need to apply that lesson. Or you'll get a lesson today and I'm like, wow, I wish I would have had that yesterday with the situation. It goes exactly with what I needed. But now I know I have a new tool in my toolbox to be able to apply it when this thing comes up again, right? this trigger or whatever the issue is. So, or the situation. Um, so I read the book, did the lessons, and then somehow got exposed to um, the law of one, the rod books. So I read those. And then I've read, I've only read about half of the keys of Enoch um, because the first half made a little bit of sense. The second half, not that it doesn't make sense. I'm not, I haven't quite figured out yet where it's applicable to me because you have to understand the material to be able to apply it. So the keys of Enoch, the first half I've read and, 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 and they make it sound so simple. I mean, even the Course in Miracles makes this life would be so simple if we just did X, right? And yet we make this life so much more difficult than we need to. So much more difficult. Well, it's the contrast that we came to uh, experience so that we could move beyond the contrast. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the purpose of this podcast is so that we start to get comfortable with the non-labels. We start to get comfortable with the integration of the spiritual lives within our professional lives in that it becomes an integration of our whole life because mm -hmm. it is truly who we are, spiritual beings having a physical experience, and that we are all getting there at the same time through different possible different means and that whether it's A Course in Miracles that lit you up or it's, you know, the Book of Enoch that lit you up or, and sometimes the hunger is so strong. Like when I had the wellness center, people would, would be um, taking every class imaginable right after another. Mm -hmm. So hungry for that spiritual connection and for moving into the fullness of who we really are. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you just want to get there as fast as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so what I urge people is to take it, be in that hunger space, but integrate each level of it because we are not who we are. You said it yourself. You're not who you are. You are now that you were, you know, mm -hmm. years ago and, um, have this conversation all the time. And we hope that we're not going to be the same or have the same beliefs in a year from now, because otherwise we would be atrophying, we wouldn't be growing, we would not be expanding, we would not be moving uh, into our fullness. Mm -hmm. So I love that so many of the people that I'm, I am blessed to be friends with, including yourself, um, that you have the courage and bravery to step forward into your fullness in your spirituality 
and integrate it into your life because we need attorneys that are spiritually connected because you have the intellect to be this incredible attorney. But what a loss to humanity if you said, oh, I'm just going to take all this brain power and move it into a different direction because we need you and we need others like you who will be attorneys for this new age. Mm -hmm. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah, no. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> yeah. And I look forward to it. I mean, my favorite part of my job is the spiritual conversations that I have with my clients. Again, at the end of the day, I may prepare legal documents, but it's the um, having conversations about people who are concerned about passing away because some people, or I, I don't know, the majority of people think that we are a body and that when this right. body dies, we dies, we leave, that this is it. Um, and so um, I actually have several clients that are ministers, pastors, priests, whatever, you know, whatever label they, they call themselves that, you know, I'll say, listen, we are a soul having a human experience. And they love that because they get it. You know, they understand that. I um, mean, we can have some really good conversations that maybe they can't have with people that are in fear of passing away. I have zero fear over passing away. And I would be okay if I was taken off this planet tomorrow, just because I'm not attached to anything. It, I know that none of this stuff matters. And I'm, and I'm just not attached to anything. I have a plan in place for my dog. He's the only thing that I care about and nothing else. You know, it just, these are just things. And I see people pass away all the time and they leave millions of dollars behind. You can't take it with you. And they leave a house full of what I call junk, you know, all these prized possessions. I don't care if they have a value or not. It's, it's, it's just junk junk, you know, it just does not matter. Um, it's about living your best life possible. And while going through the transition and learning, you know, getting, learning the spirituality and getting connected back to your soul is work. And I find that that's what people don't want to do. I've exposed a lot of people to this that don't want to do the work. Um, because it's just easier to stay who they are. But if you're willing to do the work, life is far better on the other side because I don't live in fear. I don't watch the news. I don't live in fear about what's going on. Um, I make decisions that are educated based on research that I want to do, not what a news agency is telling me. The news now says, we tell you what you need to know. Well, how do you know what I need to know? You know, um, it's about, you know, what information is out there and how do you find it? But I don't even know how people have time to watch the news because between work and doing all the fun stuff that I love to do, I don't have time to watch the news, nor do I want that negative energy because well, it you're is living your life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right? And, and the way that you talked about uh, the, I'm going to say traditional news, um, is that we have over time, our power has been taken away. Right. We've, our power has been programmed out of us. And it is now time that we take back our power to make our own decisions, to speak our own thoughts, and mm -hmm. to be okay with you speaking your thoughts and me speaking my thoughts, and we may not have the same thoughts. Right. That honoring each other's uh, freedoms of their thoughts. Uh, and, and that you said you do your own research. I mean, what a novel concept. You right. actually do your own research. You don't mm -hmm. just, you know... Um, we're in the United States and so we're, we're voting right now and we're not going to get into politics. But, you know, back in the day, I remember my, my mom and my, my mom's sisters all gathering to have conversations about the issues, about who are they going to vote for, about what's important. But now it's become just a, a um, popularity contest mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with doing a deep dive research within yourself about what's resonating with issues. Right. Um, and that's enough about that subject because the truth is that we can say that about anything. Well, and that's just it. And like you were going back to the point you made about um, me doing what's right with with for me and you doing what's right for you, whether we have a conversation about that or not, um, what is right for me may or may not be right for you, but it doesn't make it right or wrong either That's on right. either side of us, right? right. I am here to for my own path and to have my own experiences and to to grow my 
um, my light, right? That's why I came into this incarnation in this lifetime. Um, you came here for other reasons. So you're going to experience some, some we may coincide and some may not, but it doesn't make one right or wrong. I, I have a really hard time understanding why every, I get it. Everything is so divided and I understand it's because we're going through this great big awakening and all that, but I have a real hard time understanding it because there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody's opinions, everybody's what wants, desires, uh, learning processes, whatever that is, there's room for everybody and we can all coexist peacefully and um, and we're choosing not to. And, you know, it's five, one percent or two percent of the people that are really pulling all the strings for everybody else. And most people are just walking around, you know, like you said, they're programmed. That's why TV is called programming. Right, right. And well, yeah. and coming from the near death perspective, right? So having mm -hmm. that experience of <clears throat> just extraordinary love, no attachment, no attachment, no attachment, no attachment. So no attachment to people or experiences, just the wisdom and the knowledge of the experience. So if that's what the other side is, and in reflection, because we reflect on our experience here, if that's what that is, and this is all just about experience, and we're living on a planet that has intense contrast, mm -hmm. are we then not supposed to experience contrast, right? So we're seeing an amplified level of contrast. I mean, no one can deny that. Right. We are living in an amplified level of contrast. But as an observer, we can look at that and say, oh, I'm mindfully observer. So mindfulness equals awareness and non-judgment. So I'm kind of leaning back. I'm being the observer of what's going on. Yes. Is it a challenge to not be triggered? Absolutely. But that's part of the journey, whether you're doing the Course in Miracles, right? You're, you're reflecting on the fact that it's never really happened anyway. It's just we have to forgive ourselves for creating this illusion, I'm just kind of giving the mm -hmm. this snippet of right a course in miracles, um, or if you just believe that you know you're here to have this physical experience along with others having physical experiences to uh, to learn what it was that you wanted to learn before you came here, whether it's about forgiveness or it's about unconditional love, whatever it is that is your overarching theme of this experience that we are that we are living mm -hmm. and honoring that for everyone. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I have found it is much, I've always been an observer. I was born that way. Um, it, it is much easier to be from an energetic standpoint. It's much easier to be an observer. You're back here, you're listening, you're watching, you know, you're observing what's going on. The minute you become a participant, the amount of energy that you have to focus in on that is astronomical. And where do you want to focus your energy, right? If you only have a limited amount of energy today or a limited amount of time, where do you want to focus that energy? And is it worth getting involved in these conversations with people? Pick any, you can't even go outside and they say the sky is blue. Somebody's going to argue and say, no, it's gray, right? I mean, I guess I, yeah, I've even done that. Um, it just is, it, it, and none of it even matters. I mean, if you really go back big picture to quantum physics and we're not even here and we're just energy and, you know, our eyes can see and all this, the whole thing, all of this is just a joke. I mean, all of it, even the estate planning that I do, right? It's very difficult to sit in a room with somebody and get involved in their third density stuff and stay at a fifth density level, which is why I say most of what I say comes from someone else because I don't want to get I don't want to be sucked into their fear, the fear of dying, um, the issue they have with their children, how one child doesn't speak to them anymore and we're cutting them out of the out of the trust and, uh, you know, how people are borrowing money and they're not paying it back. Like, you know, I can story after story. There's all kind of stuff of what people do and people getting stolen from and all this stuff. So instead of getting it's very easy to get drawn into that. It can be for me, it's so much easier to sit back here and just be the observer and say, OK, I'm going to stay as to the extent that I can in fifth, fifth uh, density vibration and have a conversation with somebody who's in third density vibration. To, how do we get them to be as peaceful as possible with the situation that we're in? Because that's all I'm trying to accomplish. Yes, again, at the end of the day, I create documents, but I, 
how do I get you at peace today so that when we put something in writing, you're going to be at peace and it's not going to bother you. And you can put this issue aside and go on and live your life. By being the example and by being and living your truth, right. you attract the clients that are in need of your services and at this elevated uh, frequency. So we'll, for those who don't understand what we might be talking about as far as third density, fifth density, um, on, on its simplest form, and if you want to describe that, yep. please feel Go free ahead. to jump in, but um, just at its simplest form, it's really about um, a vibrational, uh, how you are leading your life from a vibrational perspective. So third density, very, uh, very dense, more on um, uh, reactionary, very uh, uh, fear-based. Uh, fifth density, more from a place of uh, unconditional love or love-based decision-making, um, more peace, a more healed psyche. Uh, so we, we hope to keep progressing up the vibrational scale. We'll just kind of, it is simplest form. Um, so what was you, would you call when you were introduced to the course of miracles, your biggest awakening? Oh, that was, so you want a specific situation, situation? Have you had, have you, what is like the, the most profound awakening experience or supernatural experience. Um, oh, that you yeah, have. No, I, have a, I have a couple of those. So, um, you know, of course, in miracles started me on my journey to open me up to all of this and to really tap into my intuition. I always had intuition and I listened to it. I didn't know what it was. Now, I didn't always listen to it. Otherwise, I would have had a much better life my whole life, right? You know, that's the whole point is how many times have you left to go to the grocery store or left the house and they'll you'll get that hit that says, don't forget that piece of paper and you're like, oh, I don't need that paper. And then you get to the store and you wish you had the paper, right? It's 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 as basic as that. It's just right. listening. They're giving you all the information. When you listen, they keep giving you more information. It makes your life so much easier. So I always had that. And, you know, there were times I didn't listen to it, but a lot of times I did. I didn't know what it was. Um, I just knew I just listened to it. Um, so, but that, so it made that stronger. Um, but I had some, I've had a couple really cool, uh, let me tell you my story about, um, cause it involves uh, thankfully for your Ganesha center. Have you ever heard of it? Oh. Um, so Maria, when I was being introduced to all this stuff, Maria said the Ganesha center is having this event where you can go in and have a, like a, a tarot card or angel card reading. And it's just a sample. It was, I don't know, 10, 10 minutes, whatever, 20 bucks, whatever it was. And it's, it's just a sampling for you to get to know the practitioner. And if you like it, you can go back and have a, a full on reading. We so call I said, it the alternative happy hour. <laughs> okay. So Maria, Maria took me there. It was my uh, first, I don't know if it was my only, but it was my first, uh, um, going to the, my first time going to the Ganesha mm -hmm. center and a lady was doing uh, tarot cards or whatever. And, um, she had pulled a card and she said, you know, they put the cards down and at this point in time. I didn't, this is my first time doing this. I didn't know what any of this stuff meant, but she told me I came into this life with Archangel Michael, like Archangel Michael is my angel that's here with me. And I'm like, okay, I don't know her from anybody. It's not that I do or don't believe this. I just don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we went home and that's like the one thing, I don't know what else she told me, but that's the one thing I got out of that. So I don't know, a year later, two years later, whatever, I'm at Maria's house and, and she's doing angel card reasons. She's like, would you like to do one? And I said, sure. So we're sitting down and um, she's shoveling the cards and she's like, well, what kind of, what, do you have a question? And I said, not really. I said, the only thing that's been on my mind is that card reading. I said, remember when we went to the Ganesha Center and I said, that lady told me Archangel Michael was with me. And I would like to know if that's true because I would like to have, while it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, I like to have someone to talk to. And I talk to Archangel Michael all the time. Like I like having that name. Okay. Um, we here want to have a connection, want to have a label. known a, yeah, label. So, um, so she's shuffling the cards and, you know, some fall on the, on the table and one flies out of the deck, misses the table. And the table, we're at a decent sized table, misses the table, falls onto the floor face down. She picks it up, sets it face down and keeps doing her thing, but it's a side. So we know that's the one that fell on the floor. So we're doing our thing. She picks that up. She starts laughing. She turns around and shows it to me. It's Archangel Michael, right? Now, if you know me, I, it's not that I'm not a believer, but I 
like proof, as do other people. Hence why You're I lost my skeptic. Yes, which healthy is why skeptic. I lost my connection to God because God did not present Himself. Right? I need proof, and so it doesn't have to necessarily be physical proof. He could have potentially showed me some other way, but but that I didn't get what I needed at that time, or I got exactly what I needed at that time. Right? So. So now it's Archangel Michael. So I'm like, okay, so now I talk to Archangel Michael. He's with me all the time. I asked him to live in my house. Source lives in my in my house with me all the time. So I know I'm always protected. It's in part one of the reasons why I don't live in fear, whatever. My roof could blow off. I could get water damage, whatever. It just doesn't bother me because I know I'm going to be protected. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. Um, but that was kind of my initial into all of this stuff. I've since learned how to do angel card readings. But with my clients, I've had some really cool things happen. So um, one of my clients, I went to her house because her son passed away and she wanted me to review her trust. And um, she, at this point in time, she was of the point where she couldn't leave. Most clients I meet in the office, but she couldn't leave. So I met her at her house and she had a love seat there. She was sitting in her chair. I sat in the love seat and we were talking and all of a sudden this entity came into me and I looked at her and I said, do you know that your son is here? And she goes, you're sitting on the couch that he always sat on. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I said, well, I'm just telling you that he's here. He's with you just because he's left, just know that he's here. And you know, she was, thank you. That makes me feel so much better. And this had never happened to me before. And I'm like, okay, don't get freaked out. You know, what do you do? And then finally I told him, I said, look, you have to leave. Like, it's okay that you showed up, but you have to leave. You can't stay inside my body. And then he did, he left. Um, so I've had, yeah, I've had that kind of stuff. Um, I think as I was telling you, the uh, the one gentleman who I was talking to, I had a long conversation with him. He was getting ready to go on hospice and he was in his 90s and he lived on his own his whole life and he did not want to go into hospice. And I completely understand. And I said, the problem is your body's breaking down and you can't physically take care of yourself anymore. And hospice is going to be like a two week thing. We don't know how long you're going to live. But, you know, the, the average when you go into hospice, that's different than home hospice, but go into hospice, you know, they they're pretty projecting two weeks and you're just going to go and you're going to pass away. And he said, I am not going to hospice. And he's like, I don't want that. And I said, I understand, but you can't go home and there is no other option. Like the kids wouldn't let him go live with him. So his only option was to go into hospice. So I, so I had the conversation with him. I said, you don't have to stay in this body that you are a soul having a human experience and you can leave. You don't have to stay here any longer when if you're ready leave like and he said i'm ready i said okay so i i walked out the hospice came picked him up they got him to hospice and he left his body and he was gone he didn't even make it through the night so i was kind of freaked out i'm like oh my gosh my clients are gonna call me and say what did you talk to him about because i was the <laughs> last person that's he was like i want to talk to donna he made everybody leave the room I was the last person that he talked with when we left the room. I told the kids, let's just go. They followed me out. He goes to the hospice and passes away immediately. And, and th thankfully, nobody ever came back to me and, and said anything. But I'm not going to think, what did I did? I kill your father? <laughs> no, no, no. But how powerful we are mm -hmm. in this physical mm -hmm. experience to be able to say, uh, nope. I'm out. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm finished with learning my experience. I don't need to have this process of the body deteriorating. Right. I don't need yeah. that for my mm -hmm. learning experience. Yeah. I've already learned what I needed to learn. And so now I'm ready to go. Yeah. Pop out. I had, I had an incredible encounter when my mom was passing my away. My mom had, um, I say incurable cancer, you know, I'm talking third density yes. stuff, right? Yes. And um, the last um, week of her life, when she would, she had a hospital bed in the living room. And when she would go to sleep, you know, when you sleep, you look like you're sleeping. But every once in a while, she looked like she was dead. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had known enough at this time. She passed away in 2016. So mm -hmm. I knew enough at this time that um, I'd been told, like, we kind of dip our toe when, when we're in the transition process. We dip our toe in the in the water over there and kind of see what it's like. And then you come back in your body and then you dip your toe again. Mm -hmm. So I had heard that. So, you know, sometimes my mom would go to sleep and she looked like she was sleeping. Other times she would go to sleep and she looked like she was dead. But I knew she wasn't dead because she was breathing. But if you've 
ever been around a, a person whose soul has left their body, there's a very distinct look. And I've yeah. been called in with a lot of clients. So I've been around a lot of people who have passed away. It's, I know instantly when the soul has left the body, you can see the body looks so differently. So, but my mom's reading. So I know she's not like clinically dead, you know? So, and then she, and she would do this. So she'd wake up and she'd get up out of her bed and do her thing. And then she'd come back and fall asleep. Sometimes it was normal. Sometimes she looked like she was dead. So I went and I stood next to her. Nobody else was around and I didn't say anything out loud. I just stood next to her and I asked the question. I said, does she look like she's dead because her soul has left her body and she's over experiencing, you know, whatever, getting ready to transition. Now my mom, whose mouth is open, you know, she looks like she's dead, shakes her head. Yes. And no, right up and down. Yes. And it was incredible and freaky at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, what an incredible gift. Then yes. when she eventually woke up and she was fine and all that, and I, I didn't talk to her about it. I didn't say anything. Um, my mom was raised Catholic and lived in a lot of fear. So we, you know, we have really good conversations now that we couldn't have when she was alive. But I thought, what an incredible gift that she gave me by, by having that, by showing me that. And, and she did it when she was looking like she was dead. So I knew she was like out, totally out, you know, it was really incredible experience. That's that is incredible. And that you had, you were in a place to have the awareness, to be able to ask the question, to be able to get that gift. Mm -hmm. So I think that so many of the world, so many people in the world aren't willing to do the work or open the window to the possibility of having these magical experiences mm -hmm. with spirit. Mm -hmm to confirm that we are more than just these bodies. Right. And when you do, yes, the work is hard to do the inner work, to do the deep dives of our physical experience and all the emotional traumas and, and things that, that we have brought on to be able to learn these experiences. I know that won't be popular, but... Um, but to be able to be in that space of being open to have the thought, to have that question so that you could receive that extraordinary mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. Yep. And my yeah. mom shows up all the time um, in different ways. You just have to be open to that possibility. And there is one thing I won't say what it is because I don't want anyone to know, not that it's a secret. It's because I always want to know that when she's talking to me, I know. So I always yeah. ask her the same question. If you're going to be around, like if I have someone doing a reading for me or something, um, or one of my friends who does massages is very spiritually connected. And so I always tell my mom, Oh, if I'm going to be working with her, or if I'm going to do a reading, um, this is how I want you to, to through them, let me know that you're here. And every time it comes, every single time the person says what it's so funny, which is why I don't want to say it out loud. Cause I don't yeah. want people to know what that is. Um, cause I want to keep it pure. I want to know that that's actually my mom coming through. Yeah. Yes. But I smelt her one day. I opened my closet door and, um, it was a spare closet. There was no clothes or anything in there and it smelled just like my mom. And I thought, well, this is interesting because I'm looking around and, um, there's nothing like it's not even like I took a sweater of hers or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't take any of her clothing because we don't wear the same size clothes. And I had nothing of hers in the closet. I didn't have a blanket, no shoe, nothing. And that closet, when I opened it, it smelled like her. And it's interesting that she did that because my mom's Italian and she made everything from scratch. And mm -hmm. I would always tell her, like, I want to walk in the house and smell spaghetti sauce. You know, <laughs> like, let me know that's how you're here. And she doesn't. To this day, I've never smelled smell spaghetti sauce. Yeah. I did smell her. My grandfather does the same thing. He had a very specific kind of cologne that he wears and I'll be in my house all by myself and I'll smell him. Like I know that he's around. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really incredible how they, how they show, show up and I dream about him and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff too. I love when you get the, the scent because the first time that happened to me, I'm like, I'm smelling something inside my head. Mm -hmm. Like yes. you don't smell it from the external it's inside your head. It is right. the most bizarre thing, mm -hmm. um, but fun. I mean, yeah. like, you know, it is, it, all these people will call them gifts, extrasensory things that we have access to are really pretty phenomenal. Right. And we all have them. I'm not yes, special. <laughs> you know, it's not that I could, you know, do things and tap into things. You know, yes, I do. Uh, you know, this is not something I disclose to people. Um, 
Well, you Obviously, will be now. I am today, right? <laughs> um, but yes, I do healing energy for people. I do it mainly on myself, but I do have some people that want me to do it for them that are open to it. And I, and I do that kind of stuff. And um, I have a whole bunch of cards and I do what I call, you know, angel card readings. And it's funny because people come to my house and they think they're books. And I'm like, oh, no, they're angel cards. And, and I'll ask people, do you want me to do a reading for you? And a lot of people say no. I mean, they're not ready for it. And that's right. fine. You know, I do them for me. I do them for my friend Maria. She does them for me. So um, I do a lot of the stuff that I do, I learn from me. But if I am supposed to do it for other people, I'm open to it. It's one of the conversations I have every single day. I'm in constant contact with source. I don't pray. I don't like, oh, you know, uh, save me from this or bring me money or whatever the case is. I don't I don't do that. Um, I just am constant in constant contact with source. I'm, it's like a 24 hour day dialogue. I'm, I always ask, you know, use me to shine your light on everybody. Show me what I'm supposed to do. Tell me what I'm supposed to tell people. I don't ever want to be the one talking when the information comes in, you know, it comes in, I just send it out. Um, I don't want to, I don't want it to be Donna being the one having the conversation with people. And I always say, put those people in front of me that I'm supposed to help. I don't advertise. I do have a website people can go to, but I don't advertise. I don't ask people to give me reviews online. I don't do any of that stuff. I know when my phone rings, I'm supposed to help that person. Even if I'm giving them free legal advice and sending them off on their way, because maybe either I can't help them or they don't have an estate big enough, or they need a different type of attorney or whatever the case may be, or maybe they need a divorce attorney first, and then they need an estate planning attorney. Whatever it is, I just know that when my phone rings, I'm supposed to answer that call. Beautiful. Well, I, I'm smiling ear to ear because uh, towards this, obviously in the second part, because we usually do more of the spiritual discussions in the second part, I always ask, do you pray? And in my head, I was saying, oh, don't forget to ask the question. And then you went right into um, the answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. Love it. yeah. So, um, well, I think we could continue this conversation for a long time, but uh, Donna, I just want to thank you so much for all of your insight into estate planning and your authenticity and vulnerability, really, in, in sharing your spiritual life with us. And we will put in the description how to contact you. And if uh, you, you are in Nevada, and you're interested in estate planning, you will uh, get the information of how to contact Donna. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. We hope you enjoyed this episode and appreciate your engagement. A thumbs up, comment about the most valuable piece of wisdom you gleaned, and sure would appreciate it if you would click that subscribe button and notification bell. These simple acts help to build this channel so that we can continue to bring you special individuals that have an inspiring message or story to share. Join us next week for another fascinating soul who has something special to bring to the tapestry that is Sunday Communion Podcast.